When I was a kid, my dreams was to perform, to be a singer, an artist. My dream is true now. I mean, it's really hard sometimes to understand that, I mean, that people know who we are all over the world. Of course, there's a price to pay. Sometimes you get very uh, upset when you, you see that people don't care about our privacy. But there's something you have to live with and there's something you, you must take as in this situation what we are now. Because those people who really come up to you, they, they just want maybe say hello or maybe they want an, an autograph. And, and sometimes they've been traveling so far. I mean, you have to think of that all the time, that for them it means so much. And for me, it's maybe five seconds. Six years of, of uh, international success has really sort of changed our lives, it changed everything around us, it changed most of the people's, people around us, it changed their lives too, you know. But uh, only in a positive way, you know. It's, we learned a lot and we, we've done things that, you know, we can only dream of or not even dream about. I think once in a while you have to ask yourself, uh, especially when you're having success, why are you doing this? You know, why, 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 why are you touring? Why are you making the records? Why are you write the songs? And for me, it's always been like something that has to be done. And even though I love selling all these albums, but still, if we haven't sold any albums, I'll still be writing the same songs. You know, it's it's the best thing I know, and um, I just I just enjoy it more than anything else.
Voxet is a band who has always been a touring band, uh, and uh, I think that's what music is all about: is to to work on stage, to to meet the audience, and to. I think that it should be really boring after a while, and not to to play and to play together, be a band, work on stage. Ah, <laughs> Someone told us that we did like 1,300 interviews in the first eight months or something like that, which is crazy, you know. Um, the, we come from a live tradition as well. We've always been touring with every album we released. Even before Roxette we did that. So it's always been natural for us to spend a lot of time on the road touring and meeting the fans and doing shows. We played on the last tour now, with, 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 which we came off in uh, mid-May. Uh, we toured for 10 months playing basically everywhere except <laughs> North America. <laughs> Everyone feels much more secure and have enjoyed this tour much more than the last tour. You know? It's because everyone knows, you know, the pressures and uh, you know what it's like to travel for like ten months, you know, you know with with twenty idiots, you know. <laughs> Five shows so far. It's always tough uh, to have a, a long longevity in your career. So, so I'm really pleased that we're still able to sell out you know, stadiums here and there and arenas here and there. Right now, it's, Roxette is absolutely the best because we have all the experience. And uh, so I think that really our career starts now. I mean, he was a teenage superstar in Sweden for years, but he's gone down. He had made a couple of records as a solo artist. I think it were great records, but they weren't really Per Gessler. They were too serious. Uh, and I just had the idea, I had this great song that, that Per wrote, that I said, shit, why don't we try this with Marie? Marie was a bit hesitant in the beginning. She said, okay, we'll do it. I said, we'll do it, we'll test it. If you don't like it, we'll throw it away. And he became a hit in Sweden. And this is how it was started. The first three years, I guess, was um, up and down. You know, we really obviously released the first album, 1986, Pearls of Passion. Uh, but at the same time, Marie was, you know, building her solo career. So I was sort of, sort of afraid that she 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 wouldn't take Roxette seriously. Uh, and at the, uh, there was actually a point I think when nobody really expected her to take it seriously because it's it was just another thing, uh, you know, uh, my songs. Let's try to get abroad, see what happens. But she, the real thing for her was her own career. I always felt that Marie was a fantastic performer. She can really deliver a, a song and she can deliver lyrics. Even if it's not much of lyrics, she can still make it mean something. And Per has always been a fantastic songwriter. So we really felt that, okay, let's have a go at this and see if we can come up with something that can happen internationally. We really didn't do it for Sweden. We did it for, for international exploitation. Hi, it's Aaron. I'm at Abbey Road Studios. We're running about an hour behind time. Um, but we think we're fine. We're just about to start recording the acoustic session right now. Walking like a man, hitting like a 
like a hammer, she's a juvenile scam Never was a quitter, tasting like a raindrop She's got the look A heavenly bound Cause heaven's got a number when she's spinning me around Her kissing is a color, her loving is a wild dog She's got the look 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 What in the world can make a brown-eyed girl turn blue? When everything I'll ever do, I do for you And I go, la, 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 she's got the look It was early January and the album was like triple platinum or something in Sweden. And I, felt in the, I was on my way from Coffs Harbour to Sydney in a car. And it was the middle of the night and I found this phone booth. And I thought, I'm going to call Pear. So I did. And um, I said, hi, how it's going? You know. And he said, where are you? I said, I'm in Australia. I'm in the middle of the nowhere on a road. And he says, well, you should be here. And I said, well, what, what's wrong? What's happened? What's... Nothing is happening, he said. Absolutely nothing. And I said, well, well, as far as I know, the album's gone 350,000 in two months. You know, I think that's great. But nothing is happening outside of Sweden. Nothing, nothing. Banging on the head drum, shaking like a mad bull. She's got the look. We heard the uh, rumors that uh, one of our songs were getting airplay in the States. And uh, at the time, we worked uh, Listen to Your Heart at home. So we thought it was Listen to Your Heart, or maybe even Dress for Success, because that was the the first single off the album. But then I, I read Billboard magazine and I realized it was The Look, and The Look at the time wasn't even released as a single at home. It was just like the opening track of the album. And I, I didn't really want The Look to be the first song on The Look Sharp album because I was singing it, because I felt like, hey, Marie has to sort of deliver the goods here. But she was like, hey, this is the best song, you sh it should be the first song, even if you sing it. America opened the door to all countries in the world and, you know, The Look was number one in, I think, 25 countries or something. And it just was a snowball that started rolling and what you had to do was to try and keep up with it and, and make sure that you didn't miss out on anything. And I think that being new, all of us being new at what we were doing, None of us really knew exactly how the international music market worked uh, in a situation like that. I think we did extremely well and uh, it was a start of a very long and prosperous career. Boxset fans all over the world are very active. They know all the songs and they they are very fantastic people. In the morning, I can hear them singing all the songs outside my window and, uh, and shouting uh, our names all the time. So it's fantastic. Really, it's really hard to explain because it's so weird. It's uh, and they're standing there, even if it's raining or if it's cold, and they're standing there anyway, and just waiting and waiting, waiting for us. Very touching. Really. Without the fans, we wouldn't be here. So it's, uh, it's not really a big problem. It's everything about them. They yeah. are so kind and always nice. And I know. And I have many friends because of Roxette, they all. <laughs> People think Roxette fans are like 10, 12, 13 or something like that, but that's not true. I mean, we're here uh, 19 to 22, and I think this is um, stupid. They all think they are a teenager band or something like that. They're not. Roxette is, uh, first of all, youth group, a uh, group for young men, uh, you see. Uh, I like uh, Mary. Everyone is special, and uh, this doesn't exist uh, 
Twice. Mm. Oh, just for you. Thank you very especially. much. Especially. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, still your greatest fan. <laughs> I think it's, it's good. It feels, it, it's good for the ego. <laughs> If we are playing a really big arena uh, and you see that the people in the front row that they're really that it's bad for them that they're crushing into each other and, and uh, people are fainting and I mean it's horrible I hate it really because of course you see it but you have to concentrate on what you're doing. You have to trust your security people that they really take care of the audience. Feel so sad for those people because I think that's it's uh, they must feel a lot of panic and uh, maybe they after being through that kind of thing never go to concert again. All of them have been coming for us when they go home. I really want them to have a really good memory for what we are doing. I don't want them to have a memory that it was so hot or that they fainted or that they were crushed into the stage. So it's a little bit frightening, you know, it's when so many people. It's, it's wild. It's, uh, it's, uh, what can I say? I'm just as shocked as everyone else. <laughs> On the road is uh, starts uh, sort of 12, 1 o'clock. You know, check out from the hotel and go to the uh, airport and another flight, <laughs> another country, another city. And uh, okay. usually we have four four shows a week. So uh, a normal day is, is very much you know going checking into the hotel after the flight and. Go to the venue, do a sound check, and then back to the hotel. A couple of hours of resting, and then uh, you know, doing the show. The social life is always your your bad conscience, so to speak. You know, you're always away, and um, you never meet your family or, or your friends as much as you, you you're supposed to do or, or you want to do. So um, over the years, I guess you you you, you tend to have a, a smaller amount of people that you really you know really close with. And, uh, but I guess that goes for everyone in this business, you know, you travel a lot. I don't know how many flights, but it was over, over I think, 250 flights in a year. And it was 
so weird. And in the end, in the end, it of course it affects your art. Why should I cry over you? with Roxette starts from the actual fact that Per and Marie want to go on tour and that we discuss when we should do it and when we would get the most effect of doing it both from an audience point of view and from their point of view. The cost of touring are extremely high if you in comparison to the income so that's why a tour really have to be around a hundred shows to make economical sense because the startup costs are so high. It's like a theater, really, you know, you have to buy the props, you have to build the props, you have to rehearse, you have to spend a lot of time in that preparation. And that's where your bulk of your costs are. Then the rest of, of that is a lot of hard work for everyone concerned in planning, mapping out the world, finding the people to do the job, because there is about 35, 40 people that travel with the band. Because we go on commercial, but they can't, it's only one okay. second the where they are. Yeah. Joyride, they still commercials and yeah. Got it. Take the bass, we'll take the bass with us. What about the guitar? Yeah, and the Gibson, yeah. As a tour manager, uh, it's to get people from A to B, the easiest, the smoothest, the most comfortablest way as, as possible. Um, and so they don't really notice that they've moved from A to B. We try to do it that way. Of course, everybody knows you have to sit in cars and fly. And... But if they can get there without hanging around in airports and lobbies, and so they can just leave, travel, now that's one of the biggest parts is to, to make sure they're happy and comfortable. And both of them are very, very, uh, I wouldn't say easy to please, but the both of them are very understanding. You know, like sometimes you can fix them and sometimes you can't. I think the longest we've done is a two-month stretch. Sounds like a prison sentence, two-month stretch. <laughs> Privately, it does affect it with being away from the, my wife and son in such a long time. Like, uh, if them, uh, stay away from home two months without seeing each other, it, it, that, that hurts. Uh, that really does hurt. <laughs> I would say this crew, we've been ex exceptionally lucky because everybody's known each other for many, many years and we've always we've worked together in, in, in doing Swedish tours with different bands. But, uh, there's never ever been, been any uh, troubles or hassle or amongst us. Everybody knows exactly what they've got to do. They all do the job, isn't it? I think it's one of the best crews ever I've seen. <laughs> You work every day. There's no time at all. Either traveling or you're in a, a, a hotel room or you're in a, a venue. I love when you do that on this focus. Life on the road uh, is uh, it's very special, very um, kind of a gypsy life. 
the traveling takes a lot from you because the time changes all the time and the very often very late nights and it's it's not a not a you know nine to five work. <laughs> When you start off small, you, you, your dreams are always, you know, to conquer the world or to see how far you can go. When, you, when you've done that, you realize that there is no difference, you know, it's the same thing, basically. It's the same, you have to have the same attitude when you play in front of 200 people or if you play in front of you know, 50,000 people. Obviously, the stage is bigger. You have to behave differently. The best part is, you know, the two hours on stage. That's the, that's really makes you feel. I mean, that this is something good to do because you get so much back from the audience all the time. I'm just very, very, very thankful, and grateful that we have been through all this success, and that, and I'm so proud that people like us so much and that they knew all our songs. the production manager, which means that um, I coordinate all the technical things for Roxette. Make sure that all the equipment gets from place to place, make sure that all the crew get from place to place. Today, for instance, I'll give you a rundown. We were here, we left the hotel at 8 o'clock. We'll, we work through the day, the show will finish 11.30, 12 o'clock. We then pack the gear up go to the airport, deal with the freighting. Maybe I'll get back to the hotel uh, at four or five o'clock this morning. So you work, some days you work, you can work 20 hour days. Everything can go wrong. There's not one thing that cannot go wrong. You gotta be ready for everything to go wrong. But especially with Roxette who go to different countries than most bands are. Most bands would never go to the countries that Roxette go to. Where's the coffee? 
This time we really wanted to go to places where we've never been before, like South Africa, China, um, Peru, Lima. Um, we're going to Moscow as well, Russia. It's fantastic that, uh, that we can do that. When you go to places uh, like Moscow, like uh, uh, Manila, you know, the, the promoters always want you to see the nice things, you know. But of course, I mean, we, we live in a sort of secluded world as well. I mean, it's, it's hard for us to sort of, you know, really get into what's going on. You know, you have security people everywhere. And you live in fancy hotels and have cars everywhere. We have been traveling everywhere, but it's, we've seen so little. It's, it's, it's a shame. I think it's really important to, to tour in countries uh, where you've never been before, and uh, especially to countries where it's, they have a very special situation, if it's very poor or if it's uh, very close, like China. Or... We try to, you know, play basically all over the world, and I mean, there's been, you know, Especially here in, in, in Sweden, there's been a, uh, you know, some irritation over us going to, to Beijing and Moscow. But um, I don't know. I, I, we have we have lots of fans everywhere, and we, we, we do this for our fans, and we don't do it for for uh, you know for the money because there's no money there. You know? I get so pissed off from all these people who don't understand it that. Uh... That is it's a really good thing that we're doing. It's for the people, it's for our fans. It's not for, of course, it's for us as well, because we learn so much. But it's not like, like a lot of people think that, oh, we have to go to, that's a big market, or, oh, we can sell a lot of our own stuff. We're not going to be the, the generation of artists that's going to sort of you know, cash in from the Chinese people. That's, that belongs to the future. But that love falls apart Your little piece of heaven Turns to dawn Listen to your heart When he's calling for you Listen to your heart There's nothing else you can do I don't know where you're going And I don't know why But listen to your heart Tell him goodbye The importance of spending an enormous amount of time on promotion, travels, tours, television, radio studios, etc. can never be valued enough. <laughs> You start to look on the really successful artists like Roxette, like the Rolling Stones, like Phil Collins, you'll find that they do an enormous amount of press, promotion, visiting record plants, visiting these things. When you release an album for Sweden, it's, it's, uh, you do promotion for two days and then it's over. If you release an album for the world, it's take you two months. Per and I, we, we are 
a little bit different because Per, he really think is so important, and I, and he he really loves to do promotion. And I think it's really tiring to just talk about yourself over and over again. Hello. So it's a French radio station. It's the number one radio station in Canada. We have over a million listeners. The one on the television that I had scheduled a little later in the day, they're going to the radio station. So we can do, and it's an entertainment uh, TV type, entertainment tonight type of TV. So it's fast, it's capsule, it's a box pop. Okay, so we'll do the radio and then when we're there, we'll do also the TV and we'll finish a little earlier today. Roxette sont avec nous pour la prochaine demi-heure. Bonjour, Père. 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 Bonjour, When I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. But now these days are gone. I'm not so self-assured. Now I find I've changed my mind. I've opened up. Help me if you can. I'm feeling down, and I do appreciate you being around. Help me get my feet back on the ground. Won't you please, please help me? When we fight, we fight about money, probably. We don't really fight. We didn't fight in the beginning, at least. Nowadays, we fight because now this has big, become big business. They've generated a lot of money for EMI and for themselves. I am very interested in how the music business works. So it's really hard, I guess. You have to be sort of pretty smart to to sort of screw us, <laughs> I guess. In the end of the day, <laughs> Pear is a bit of a perfectionist. In my opinion, he's too much into the business side of it. I mean, if he's not careful, he might lose what he's good at on account of spending too much time on details as regards to business. Uh, we do fight about this. Everything is uh, linked together. You know, you can't really make the music and make the records and then leave everything else to somebody else. You know, have to be around and, and uh, be in control. And in the beginning, you do everything what they are saying. And it's so dangerous. It helps a lot if you are a little bit older when it happens, like it was for us. I was, we were, in, I was 30 years old, and I've been working for a very long time here at home in the music business in Sweden. But I've got a sort of one perspective out of EMI Sweden. You know, what is this company? What is this group doing for us? What does it cost nowadays? What does it give us? Whereas my bosses in America or in England would say, you know, this is okay. We don't care if you suffer as long as it's okay for the rest of the world. We want to recognize Marie 
and Pear for having sold with our company over 30 million albums in a very short period of time since 1989. So congratulations to both of you. I appreciate all your efforts for us and your music is fantastic. Thanks very much. He wins. <laughs> Hopefully we both win. I mean, let's hope, let's hope that this is a win-win thing in the long run. And never, ever, Ian, tell me to hold what yes, I'm about no. to say. Sorry, sir, it was in the middle of something. You'll be on that next flight to Australia, so fast over? buster. Umbrella? Umbrella? Bro, Coffee, guys? Jackets, please. Uh, not so much down here. It looks really nice when you're doing all that up, projecting upwards a bit more. It's just because the angle that we're at. Come on, bow. Okay, and again. It's very, very cold, and it's raining a lot, and I'm freezing to death. <laughs> it was horrible, but uh, it works really well. Shooting a video is, uh, I think, it's one of the funniest things there, there are in, in the music business because I really love to act. You've been putting up a fight, seems like nothing I say gets through. How did this all get fed a world between me and you? The second night, but the silence was a thick, you could cut it with a knife. I get up at 5 o'clock, we start makeup at 6.30, and uh, hopefully we can start to shoot at 11, 12 o'clock. Sometimes you, you don't shoot until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You have been up since 5 o'clock, so, and then you go on until it's dark. All right, shooting this time. Camera set. No, 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 no. Helen, please. It took about three hours to do the makeup, and, um, and you have to refresh it all the time, over and over again, because of the rain. And, and so, I mean, there's always something to do, thank God, in all this waiting. And uh, if there are not, we try to to have a lot of books or some papers to read. And so, yeah, try to do something else. And drink loads of coffee. This video is called You Don't Understand Me. <laughs> this, is, this is working for me, Greg. This is working for me. So I said to, to Tom Cruise when I did that real big picture, I said, Tom, I reckon you're great. And Tom replied? Tom uh, thought I was fantastic. Yeah. You're going to love it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. All right, everybody, let's give a big hand for Marie from Roxanne. Thank you. It's a really good thing to shoot videos because then you're always looking good. I mean, if something goes wrong, you can do it again. So I think it's so much more it's worse, I think, to, to, to play live. Yeah, it's a strange life. <laughs> it's really weird. States or being on a world tour. It's, it's just a sort of been a natural flow of success, thank God. And so I never really had the um, need for any compromise within my work, which is great. It's really fun, but. Uh... That's something that I really miss sometimes, that old friendship that we had in those days. 
Because nowadays, when we work, have a working relation, it's so different. To have, it's not. I really miss that. I'm a little bit sad feelings because we had so much fun together, so just as friends. I think I'm at my best when I feel that Marie is spending a lot of time with Roxette because then I have to be on my edge all the time. It's fun to be part of a, something that goes um, uh, so well that Roxette is doing. It, it's nice to be able to have an idea and uh, basically you don't really have any limits where you can go. You can, you can just sort of, you know, fool around a bit in your mind and, uh, you know, explore things, which is interesting. Of course, it's a good situation to be in. I remember once, Per said, can you, can you imagine to tour in America? <laughs> wow, no, no, no. Or maybe to do a tour in Europe, or can you imagine to, to play in New York, or, or you know, Munich, or <laughs> whatever. And, and I, oh no, it felt like it was something that was really, really far away, and oh, then you have to work so hard, and you, oh no. I, it's so tough, the music business. And, uh, but hey, we have to someday do something together in, in English.